Good morning, Joy Christian Center. How many of you are ready to worship the Lord? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, we love it this morning. Praise God. All right. Well, I, I let me ask that question. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? Apparently, we're not ready to worship the Lord this morning. We love it when, when, when our technology just doesn't quite keep up with everybody else. You got anything? No. All right, Pat. Figure it out. Yeah, let's figure it out. Why don't you wave at two or three people? This is all part of the plan. Just relax. We're working on unshakable right now. Doggone COVID. I know. All right, we're going to rewind. Good morning, everybody. Are you ready to worship the Lord today? Amen. This is the day the Lord made. We will rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. Welcome to joy and let's worship the Lord together. Praise God. Hallelujah.
up our voices to him this morning. Father, we give you honor and we give you glory and praise in this house. Oh, we thank you, Father God. We thank you that you are the God of the ages. We thank you that, that there is no other God who is like you today. Oh, we worship you this morning, Father God. I was thinking as we enter this time of worship and we worship our God together in spirit and in truth. And I often wonder, what do people think? What are people aware of? And, and uh, you know, we've got the body of Christ. We've got guests. We have people that maybe have never experienced worship like this and might seem a little bit odd to you. And I don't ever want it to be that way. But our God is a good God. Amen? And he's worthy to be praised. And there's something powerful that happens when we begin to worship the Lord together. There's something that when we honor God together, collectively, I was speaking with Roy and Caroline, uh, Shane Lane, and God. that's just that kind of day, isn't it? Hallelujah. Apparently, I wasn't supposed to mention Roy and Caroline, but... Uh, <laughs> And they were talking about they, they were not able to be here for the last couple of weeks and how much they missed just being together, just being in the house of God. And there's something powerful when the body of Christ comes together. And that's what I want you to be aware of, is that when we worship God together, when we stand together in the presence of God and in the presence of one another, something powerful happens. And it's the presence of God that comes into this place. And in John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, For God so loved this world that he gave. And I want you to know this morning that he never stopped giving. He is still giving today. He's still pursuing after you and me. So whatever it is that you feel like today that you need God to do, God is a God that is still able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen? Praise God. He is a good God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Hey, chases me down, fights till I found these in 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. So you give yourself away. Oh, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. that God loves them. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you just wave at somebody one more time and let's say thank you, Jesus, for your grace. America's in trouble. This country used to be a beacon of hope. There's a sense of helplessness because we don't feel like we could change anything. The most important thing that we can do is to pray. The only hope for our nation is Almighty God. At this next election, vote. I believe an individual person can make all the difference. Vote for candidates that stand for biblical principles and who are willing to live them. We just need to stand up. Christians need to speak out. We need to get Christians engaged. Go back to your community. Be an advocate for God's truth. It's time for God's people to stand up. Pray for a miracle, then do something. We're not just to take our light and hide it under a bushel. We're to set it up so the whole world to see it. <laughs> Amen. You gotta, you gotta like that. Goal, right? <laughs> Pray for a miracle, the the then do something. Hallelujah. Uh, the, uh, that's the Franklin Graham Association that puts those out, Billy Graham's son. I love following his stuff just because um, it just inspires, and, and, and he just touches on the issues that we need to talk about. And the first thing that he talks about, of course, and I love it, is pray. Um, I've been saying this for a couple weeks now. Uh, there's, there's been a wave of prayer across America unlike anything we've seen in a long, long time. And there's, amen. Now, the funny thing is, don't stop praying. Like, um, I know everything's going to be really perfect on Wednesday morning, you know, uh, no, but like in a month, don't stop praying. The disciplines you learn now, keep praying. Don't ever stop praying, church. Here's what I believe, and this is what I've said. There's things not happening right now in America because of your prayers. No, there's things not happening right now in America because of the prayers of the saints across our country. And then there's things that are happening because of the prayer of the saints. This morning, the Spirit of God is here. You know why? Because we're praying. And we're worshiping, so don't stop. But then the next one, of course, is vote. Now, this is funny because I just say get educated if you're going to vote. Get educated. You know, you can vote for a cow if you want to. Just pray that that cow is leading you in the right direction. 
okay? But get educated. Find out. Um, I, the other thing I wanted to know, and I, I asked Pastor Brian permission to do this. This is not good or bad, wrong or right. There's nothing about it. I'm just curious. If you've already voted, if you're among the 76 million that have already voted, raise your hand. Let's see. Well, okay, that's good. That's good. All right, you put them down. There's no reason for that other than I was just curious. Uh, so anyway, go vote. If you haven't voted, vote. I can't just, that's just vote, okay? Uh, don't lose sight of the thing that's in your hand called a vote. Now, i got to be careful because I'll start preaching and I'm not supposed to. So the other one is engage. You know when it comes to engage? It's a funny thing. We all know this country's become so icky. That's the word I'll use, icky. We can hardly engage. You know what? I think God just wants to train. I thought he was young. He told me he was 29. He said, that's not young. I said, oh, brother. I said, what are you reading? And he opens it. It's a book on the history of his country. And I said, that's interesting. You're reading about the history of Somalia. And he said, yeah. He said, I don't really know the history of my land. So I began to ask him. I said, tell me what's going on in your country. And he said, it's chaos. There's no government. There's no law. There's no order. There's no anything. And I said, man, you still got family there? He said, I do. I said, I, 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 pr I pray for your family. I hope they're okay. And I just was encouraged by the conversation. Now, I ended up telling him, I said, we may not see things the same way at all. I had a big flag flying on my truck. Anyway, no, no, but I'm serious. I said this to him. I said, we may not see many things the same at all. But he said this, and I said, we can agree on that. He said, I just love freedom. And I want freedom in my country. And I want order back in my country. And I said, brother, we can agree on that. Amen. So engage people. Don't, don't let the enemy tell you you can't. That's a lie. All right. Uh, anyway, get this resource. We got this. This resource, by the way, is the best Minnesota resource I've seen. They asked literally hundreds of Minnesota politicians and federal politicians seven questions. And, and some people I talked to said, oh, they probably didn't answer them. No, most of them did answer. So go look at their answers. It's revealing, all right? We got a bunch of these out on the table out there. Take them before you leave today. Um, I want to, I wanna, we don't receive an offering physically. You guys know the ways to give. You can give as you leave today in the baskets. You can give online. You can give in the kiosk in the lobby. You can, get, you can text to give, so we appreciate that. We know you're learning how to do that. There's all kinds of ways to, to get your, your seed into the ground here at Joy Christian Center. But I want to read a, a verse to you, and then I want to pray with those who give online, those who are online watching right now. I'll pray with you, but I'm going to read this. You've heard the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I thought it was interesting. I was reading that verse, and then I backed up. I want to read it out of a different translation because before the Holy Spirit, through Paul, said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said this, I've learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. I know what it means to lack. And I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. Now, I like this. For I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And then he said this part. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I, I, that, that was my verse one day this week. I was meditating on, I've got to learn, Lord, just to be satisfied with what you've given me and not be afraid when it feels like lack. The next morning, it, I'm taking a shower and I'm complaining to my wife about the shampoo she bought. No, the Holy Spirit hit me and my wife almost hit me. <laughs> no. Because if we're going to say this stuff, we got to do this stuff. Lord, teach me to be content with what I've got, whether little or a lot. And then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. All right, I'll pray. And then I have one more announcement for you. Father, I thank you that you give seed to the sower. I thank you, Lord, that you provide for your saints. We'll never be found bragging for bread. Lord, your word teaches us that. So, Lord, help us to be content. Whatever we have. Whatever we have, help us to do that. And then we know that through your power, we'll be able to do anything, anything, God, that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to be doing a blood drive here at Joy Christian Center on Tuesday, November 24th. We want to start to get the word out. Now, I just learned something about this. Paula, our online, one of our online hosts, asked, do you have to register for this? My answer was no, you don't. And actually, you don't have to register. But you can go to Red Cross's website and pre-register. It's the 24th from 1 to 7. You'll hear about that again. So um, anyway, just want you to know that. And then we have one more announcement, but it's coming to you via video. To be a family church teaching people to reach their world. And one of the ways we are endeavoring to do that is by Second Saturday Church with Benefits. 
you and your kids get to come to church on a Saturday night. You experience all the things that you normally would on a Sunday, and then you get to leave your kids with us while you go do whatever it is that you want to do. Date night? Watch a movie. Go shopping. Learn a new hobby. The sky's the limit. What will you do with your time? One thing I can promise is that your kids will have a blast. So invite some friends and we will see you soon. We know you probably have more questions. So head on over to greatdoor.org where you can find out all the details. Amen. Praise God. Strong well, we hope families build a strong church. Yes, they do. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to step on that line. Uh, good morning. Welcome. There, there are so many things that I just heard this morning that I feel like I need to comment on, like the butt blood drive. How appropriate is that for Halloween weekend? I mean, kind of, I think about that weird stuff. It's like I'm praying and asking God to direct my thoughts. And has this not been a crazy weekend? I mean, we've got Halloween. We've got a time change. We have uh, a full moon. And then I think there was a blue moon or something else. It's like, can anything else happen? And we found out what could happen right up here on a Sunday morning, right before God and you and everybody else. And, and actually, I just, Pastor Steph is watching online today. I, I just want her to know that we did that for her. We don't want her to feel like she's not that necessary or not that needed, and so I just want to make sure, Pastor Steph, that, that you understand that uh, we need your help from time to time as well. She's been bouncing back and forth between uh, up here helping out and back in the kids and things like that, so uh, there is that as well, praise the Lord. I understand that we've got people in overflow and uh, uh, other rooms and stuff, so let's give them a big hand. Thank you for coming this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Doing our best, doing our best to try to just minister to, minister, that almost right, we're doing our best, we're doing our best, we're just trying to minister in the mess. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad for the grace of God and the love of God? Man, I tell you what, I, I, I am so grateful that God loved us enough, that he loved us enough to, to pursue after us, to, to enact the plan of salvation, to, to, to bring redemption to this earth, and we didn't deserve it, we didn't, as, as we just sang, we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it, but yet God loves you and he loves me so much, and he loves the people of the world so much, and, and it is just such a wonderful, I think, blessing for us to be able to enter into the presence of God and worship him and be so thankful for that uh, and what he's done in, uh, in our lives. And I want to remind you just very quickly one thing before I kind of jump into the message this morning, and that's about second Saturday. We've got four of them scheduled right now on the second Saturday of November, December, January, and February, and really the, the heart of this is, is really from a couple of things. But number one, uh, as, as in the month of March is kind of the world shut down and all the things that were going on went on and we've lived through that. And um, I feel like the families, our families here, but the families overall, school teachers, things like that, have really paid a price that many others don't. For Shelly and I, we're on the other side, thank goodness, we're on the other side of, of children, and, and they're grown after a fashion anyway, and uh, doing great jobs in, in, in their lives. And so our world didn't change a whole lot, but for those of you that are trying to figure out distance learning and all of the other things that are going on, we wanted a way to really be able to bless our, our families and, and to provide in a way what we're calling a date night, just whatever it is that you guys want to do in our children's ministry and volunteers will help to take care of that and, and uh, you know what, we're going to try it. We're going to just try to be a blessing. Is that all right with everybody? Amen. We want to be a blessing. That's, that's always been our heart. We're a family church that's teaching people to reach the world. And as we have said, as you heard it said, strong families will build a strong church. And we know that mom and dad time is, is, is very, very important. And uh, those of you that have children said... Mom and dad time is kind of important from time to time, isn't it? So we're doing a series that we're calling Unshakable. And uh, the idea of Unshakable really is, is, is found in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. This is our third week of this topic that we're kind of exploring and digging into and kind of trying to weave my way around. And it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken... That is the created things, so that what cannot be shaken 
may remain. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. And there was a principle that I'm wanting to dig out there. There's a whole lot that was going on in the book of Hebrews as the writer of Hebrews wrote this, but there's just one thought in, tucked in that verse that says that there are things that were created, the things that we sense and know and feel, that, that those things get shaken, but they get shaken for a purpose. And that purpose is to reveal something that cannot be shaken. And that is the kingdom of God. That is this eternal, powerful, on the rock kingdom of God. And so here the writer is saying that sometimes in life, whether it's people, Pastor Steph, didn't she do a great job last week? Uh, if you were not here last week, I encourage you to go online and, 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 and listen to that message. Very difficult for, for her to share, for us to kind of go through and experience. And even sitting here on Sunday morning, you know, between crying and pride and all those other things, it's just like, you know, thank you, God. Nobody wants to go through the testing. Nobody wants to go through the shaking. But it revealed something that wasn't able to be shaken. And, and it's so important that you and I understand, and it's why I preach, and it's what's always on my heart, is I want to help you to be prepared for the eventualities of the storms of life because storms are going to come. Do not be surprised when your life gets shaken. And sometimes what will happen is that that shaking will cause things that we have trusted in to be removed. That shaking will cause things that we have put our trust in that God says, I don't want you to trust in the chariots or in the strength of men. I don't want you to trust in those things. I want you to always trust me first and foremost. And so whether it's in your life, whether it's in our, in, in our community or in our state and our nation or in the world, things sometimes get shaken to reveal things that cannot be shaken. And that's when we, the body of Christ, need to be ready to, to strike, if you will, to, to be the blessing and to be the light and to be the hope of the world. And, and the way that that was lived out in the early church, first century church, I want to read this scripture in, second, or in Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to read the whole thing, kind of a long little text here. But when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into to them, and for three Sabbaths, for three weeks, he reasoned with them, that was the Jews that were in the synagogue, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, now, now, now this whole thing about this, this rabbi, this, this troublemaker, that this Jesus of Nazareth, for, for Paul to go into a synagogue, and, and man, it was mixed. It was, there were people on both sides, and they, they hated it, and some loved it. And for three weeks, Paul began to expound, begin to share, and begin to talk about what they considered this dead rabbi, this dead teacher, this troublemaker. Verse, he's, this is what he said. This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And some of them, that's the Jews, some of them were persuaded. And, everybody say and. and. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks. And not a few of the leading women. <laughs> they joined Paul and they joined Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, say not persuaded. Not persuaded. Those that were not persuaded, what did they do? They became envious. And they took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, they set all the city in an uproar and they attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them, Paul and Silas and others, out to the people. Verse 6, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Verse 7, Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, there's another king, Jesus. And I think that sometimes we just read over this. We just sort of pass by like, yeah, isn't that nice, good, you know. Ooh, that's a cool scripture. He turned the world, they turned the world upside down. Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't think that we really understand the disruptive nature of Christianity. I don't think that we understand what was going on in those first few moments after Jesus rose from the dead. And when you read this text and you see that Paul went into the synagogue, which would be normal for him as a teacher of the Jews, to begin to expound from the Old Testament, which would be normal until he began to bring Jesus into the mix that he was the one. But what I want you to see is that it was the message of Jesus that caused Jews, Greeks, women, eventually poor, slave, free, People from all regions, all areas, Christianity 
upset the apple cart because there was a system. There was a class system. There were the elites. There were the have-nots, uh, the haves and the have-nots, birth order and wealth. That determined your position in life. Your nationality determined your position in life. And Christianity came into it, and it disrupted everything. It changed everything. And suddenly, under the guise of the banner of this new king called Jesus, it caused all of the cultural distinctions and all of the gender distinctions and everything else to melt away so that they could take up this banner of Christ and it changed the world. But it didn't change it often in a beautiful, sweet, loving, peaceful way. There were people who stood against it. And that has been the message. That has been really what, what has happened. But I don't want you to miss the fact that Christianity has always been disruptive. Where, I'm not saying religion. I hope you understand there's a difference between religion and Christianity. Christianity is a living, vibrant relationship with a risen Savior. Christianity is hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Religion is a set of form and rules and conduct. It is man's approach to reach to God. But true Christianity is God's relational, transformational move in your life to make you a different person and create within you a spirit that can connect with God. And that's a big difference. And so it wasn't religion. It was Christianity that was extremely disruptive. And so I want to, with that backdrop, they changed the world. They turned the world upside down. And I wanted you to hear that because I want to step into some things just about the election. And there's, you know, some boilerplate stuff that most of you know and, and those kinds of things. But I, I want to give you a couple of guiding thoughts. As you know, we have a president, presidential election this week. I, I didn't see. I, I kind of looked, peeked out. How many of you have already voted? Those kinds of things. One of my favorite things, I won't tell you the political party, but it said, if I die, please don't let me vote for so-and-so. <laughs> some of you would get it on the way home. <laughs> you see, the reason for this series, Unshakable, the reason for the series before on Stand, and I could go all the way back to uh, Seize the Day, to be quite honest with you, uh, just as I have felt the Spirit of God leading us in, in different ways and topics and seeing how they fit in. But I knew that this Sunday I'd be talking about the election, and it's why I chose the reason, I chose the title of Unshakable. Because whether or not you believe it, and I think we're all hearing this, like I, I said it a couple of weeks ago, this is for sure the second and I think the third election that I've participated in that I have heard the words, this is the most important election of our time. Now, I think every election is important. And I do believe that every election the stakes are pretty high. And, and what drives me today is simply this. We live, we all know this, right? We live in a polarized nation, do we not? I mean, there, there are two pretty distinct sides, if you will, that are fairly entrenched. <laughs> Amen. How many of you have relatives? There's two distinct sides. How many of you know that probably there, there's people that have just heard that? They're like, they're, they're on the other side, and they, they don't like you. <laughs> and you don't maybe like them. And so this, this idea that, that, that we live in this polarized nation and, and uh, you know, roughly 50% of this nation is going to wake up, assuming we know, I don't know when we're going to know when, when our president is, but, but assuming, well, Wednesday, okay, Pastor John just said Wednesday, all right, amen. Oh, me of little faith. All right. I think it's going to be contested regardless of who wins. That's my opinion. I, I, I pray that I'm totally wrong and that I'm just, you know, wrong. But anyway, uh, regardless of when we find out who that president is, 50%, roughly a little less than 50% of the nation is going to be upset and angry and afraid and, and, and all of those other things, regardless of who wins, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, we have been led to believe that because this is, and it, it is true, every election is important. But I want you to hear something before I launch into a few things. That dynamic that we see happening out there beyond the four walls of the church, same thing that's in here. I hope you understand this morning that we have people on both sides of, of, of the political aisle in this building right now hearing my voice. And you know what? I would go out on a limb and say the vast majority of those people love Jesus. And I would go out on a limb and say the vast majority of those people love this church. And I would say that most of those people want to serve God and worship God and live for God just like you and I want to serve God and worship God and live for God. Amen? 
You need to understand that. You might be sitting next to a liberal. And you might be sitting next to a conservative. Ah! And I know that all of you say, how can somebody be a Christian and not vote for the person that I'm voting for? That dynamic plays out from Facebook to Washington, D.C. Both sides think that Jesus is on their side. Both sides will use scripture to, the, to opposite ends, but it's the same scripture. We have people that love God that don't, always, that don't always agree politically. My job is not to represent a political party. My job is to represent the kingdom of God that will not be shaken. It is to give you every opportunity that you can to engage in this God that wants you and me to be a transformational part of society and life. It's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have said many times to you that I am a branch manager of a worldwide organization whose goal is global domination. And that can make people uh, a little bit uncomfortable. Wait, are you saying are you saying that what you preach and teach is the only way? No, I'm saying that Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. And so we're not taking sides in that sense. And, and, and here's what I want you to understand this morning. We may never agree politically. But we can live and love unconditionally. In fact, I, I, as I put that down, I, I wondered if I shouldn't reverse the words we can. We may never agree politically, but can we still love unconditionally? Can we do that? Can we exalt the, the law of Christ? Love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. Can we exalt that above our party and our politics? And what happens? What happens when our support of a political candidate or a platform or whatever it is, what is, what happens when there's perhaps space between what we see in the word of God and what that party is representing? Can we close that gap to the point where we're still followers of Jesus, even though it makes us disagree with things that we're hearing and seeing? And I think those are important questions for us to, 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 to wrestle with. And so I want to give you a couple of guiding thoughts. And number one, for those of you who say, well, I don't like either candidate. I'm not voting at all. I get it. There's good reasons to vote for and against people. There really are. But I don't know if you've noticed or not. <laughs> Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, they're not on the ballot. Not going to get a perfect person. Amen? Amen. And for those of you that perhaps say, well, I'm not going to vote because I don't like either one of them. Uh, in fact, well, I don't go. Don't want. Anyway, some of you think this, well, it's only one vote. One vote isn't really going to matter. It is the one thing that you have. It is the one thing that you have to, to lend your voice to the other many, 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 many other voices that are out there. It's the one thing you have. And I think it is a lie of the enemy to tell people that that one vote doesn't matter. I think it's a lie of the enemy to try to silence the voice and the influence of the body of Christ to make you think, you know that in the last six presidential elections, uh, uh, they were selected by about 10 million votes, and, and that is without 30 million Christians voting. Midterm elections, about 65 million Christians did not vote. I think midterms are almost more important. Your local and state elections are so important because that's where, that, that, that really is what matters to us right here. And so... I encourage you, as Pastor John mentioned, we've got materials out there. Be educated, vote, and, 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 and be aware, prayerfully consider that. There's something else. I said this a couple of weeks ago I want to remind you about. Some of you are really, really active and engaged on Facebook. And maybe you need to turn that, and you need to focus that energy, and you need to focus it and, and, and learn a little bit more, grow a little bit more, and, and you need to engage in politics. Maybe you need to run for office. Maybe salt and light needs to get outside of the four walls of this church and get involved in an office that might perhaps make a difference in a different way. So please vote. Number two, another thing, I, I want to encourage you to watch out what you're consuming the Bible tells us we're to think soberly, that we're to think righteously, that we are to think according and in line with the word of God. We know that deception is out there. I've said this many times that the experts agree. And it does not matter what you think. It does not matter what position you want to take. You can find experts that will agree with you. And it's, on every, it's everywhere. 
And so I just want to encourage you, for those of you that, that, that enjoy Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever, all of the social media things, I just want to encourage you, approach it this way. No matter who it is that posted it, no matter who it is that, that reposts it, retweets it, shares it, whatever it is, look at it this way, that's a lie. Your first approach, that's not true. Have some discernment, even if it's a person that you trust and you know. Be aware. I, I said this, and I want to say it again. Media is designed to keep you engaged. Media is designed to keep you looking, to keep you watching, to keep you engaged. I mean, every, everywhere. I mean, the Weather Channel, we used to have blizzards. We don't have blizzards anymore. We have named storms to keep you watching. Oh, it's to keep you afraid because fear motivates, anger motivates. Fear translates to clicks and likes and shares, and that all translates into money. I am. Some of you will be saying, like, stop it. <laughs> I know some of you don't want to hear about politics, but it's so important. If you've seen the, there's a, there's a documentary that's out. It's called The Social Media. People that designed a lot of the social media that is out there, they're now kind of blowing the whistle. They're, they're, they're a little bit concerned about the direction that social media has taken. And they go into algorithms. They go into shadow banning. They go into, in, into the way that social media is shaping the thoughts of people. A lot of times it's things that we just kind of, if you've been a little bit aware, you, you know that that's happening. But, but it, it's happening to such a degree that the people that designed it and, and designed some of those algorithms and, and stuff, they're saying, kids, you're not using those things. We're not going to let you consume social media. So be careful about what it is that you're consuming. Be careful about those things. And, and, and I just want to <laughs> remind you one more time, the experts will agree. Just because you put a doctor's coat and a stethoscope around somebody's neck does not mean that they're an expert. Or they might be an expert. Everything we can, I'm sorry to beat this horse. Let me just hit it a little bit longer. Everything that we consume is, is spun. It's twisted. It's half-truths. It's edited to make us think a certain thing. I, 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 I'm saying everything to help you understand. I'm, I, I don't believe that everything is, but... Approach it like it is. Every election is about direction. I said this four years ago, and I'll say it to you again. Every election is about a direction, not a personality. And there are people that want you to believe that it's all about a personality. It is not. It is about a direction. Let me give you a quick illustration of what I mean by this and, and, and how I look at it. A party platform is the current. The party platform is the direction. When you cast your vote for whoever it is that you cast your vote for, from the president all the way down, when you cast your vote, you are voting for that person, but behind that person is the party platform. That is the current. That is the stream. That is where you and I and this nation, that's going to float your boat. And it has a destination. It has an end. And that current is going to take you and me and our nation along with it. But every river needs to have banks on either side. And, and in this nation, on one side of the river bank is the U.S. Constitution. On the other side of the river, <laughs> you may or may not, the experts agree. Atheists agree, religious scholars agree, uh, most of, of, of everybody agrees that this nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. This nation was founded on what God said. And so, that wasn't as strong as the preach it, but thank you. <laughs> and so, this current is held in check by the U.S. Constitution and the founding principles of this nation. And if either one of those are eroded or if either one of them go away, we've got some serious problems because the river overflows its banks and begins to take over everything or it, it becomes a stagnant swamp. And that's not a political comment. It is just true. It becomes a stagnant swamp where, where stuff goes to die, rot, and decay. So you need to be aware of what your vote means. You can vote for a really good per Well, I don't want to go there. I don't have time. Sorry. I will say this, the down ballots, not just presidential elections, they really, really matter. So important. Be aware. Be aware. But, but here's why it really matters. Here's why it really matters. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 2 says this, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. 
But when the wicked are in power, they groan. Now, the one thing that makes America great, the one thing that, I shouldn't say the one thing, there's many, many things, but, but the one thing that we should cherish as followers of Christ is that you and I get to choose. You and I get to choose that direction. We get to choose that course, and we get to choose that leadership, and that's rare in this world, but we get to do it. And so it's important to, to exercise that right and to be aware because on the ballot is two very, very, very different views of America on the ballot this weekend or whenever you vote or if you vote on Tuesday or whenever it is that you, you vote. There's two very different views of the role of government and how the government plays out as it affects our lives, as it affects taxation, as it affects uh, how those taxes will be allocated, two different visions about the government's role in business and in health and in all the other things that, that touch us on a daily basis. It's on the ballot this year, and it really, really makes a difference. There's two different ways, uh, uh, two very different ways and visions about interpreting the Constitution. There's two very different ways and views of the role of the courts and the Supreme Court and how it will affect our lives. There's, there's two very different views even on the founding of this nation. I think there are those that want to tear down the founding of this nation to kind of help to remove one of the banks of the river. And so we need to be careful about that. Every election, the sanctity of life from conception to natural death and protections for the unborn, they're on the ballot every single time. Yeah. Every single time, legislation that affects the structure of the fam family and human sexuality, it's always on the ballot every single time. And we get to choose. Let me say that again. We get to choose. <laughs> The First Amendment says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This is on the ballot this year. And it's on the ballot every year. And we live in a day and an age where the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion is being constrained, to say it nicely. We live in a secularized society that only values certain kind of speech. Things that might be religious in nature used to be confined. Just keep it in your churches. Don't talk about it anywhere else. But that's changing. There's a great church in the, in the state of Alabama that we are well aware of and we associate with. And, and the pastor happened a big church, you know, and, and multiple camp campuses. They do a great job with, with feeding people and they've got health uh, uh, they've established just basically almost like hospitals and, and they do great prison ministry work, just doing a great job. They have multiple campuses in multiple communities. The pastor happened to simply like something on Facebook. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it had to do, I believe, with the president liking something. Somebody who doesn't even attend the church caught that, saw that, and went to the, the, the community, went to the leaders of the community and the school board and said, this person is a hater, this pastor is a hater, and, and they have this church in this community, and we need to stop it. The, the city council, even though they didn't want to, and the leadership of that school, even though they didn't want to because they recognized the benefit of the hundreds of thousands of dollars that that church was pouring into that community, they said, you can't meet here anymore. One person. One person. To the church's credit, which I thought was so awesome, you know what they did? You know what? We're going to keep blessing that community. We're going to keep doing the stuff that we've been doing before. Isn't that cool? I didn't like it, but I thought that was a great response. In the state of Nevada, not too long ago, as it relates to the, the you know, safety and COVID, and, 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 and there's so many differences of opinion about all of that stuff. But the governor of the state said, you know what? Casinos can operate at 50% capacity, bars, restaurants, everything else, 50% capacity, keep safe. Churches, you can have 50 people. Doesn't matter how big, how safe. That went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the governor. Said, nope, churches can't have more than 50 people. Now, we're trying to keep people safe here. We really, really are. We don't believe, I hope you, don't, I hope you understand that we believe the coronavirus is a real thing. My preference is you wear a mask when you come in and when you go out. 
Now, I know for that for some of you, well, um, I, I don't have time to go into all of the some of you's. I've never seen a more contentious issue in my 30 years of pastoring this church than a mask. That's sad to me. It really, really is. It shouldn't be that way. Can we love enough? Can we love enough that when our politics, <laughs> can we? So, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, be careful of this one thing. It's called the Equality Act. Doesn't that sound great? The Equality Act. Yes, let's all be for equality. This is what it says. Basically, boilerplate, get it down to the basic brass tacks. It says, all churches, businesses, adoption agencies, and medical professionals are discriminators if they operate based on the behalf that humans are created male and female. So for me to read to you from the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 that says, God created human beings in his own likeness. He created them to be like himself. He created them as male and female. That can be, dis that can be considered discriminatory hate speech. That's on the ballot. It's on the ballot. This verse answers the questions of family structure and human sexuality. And there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misinformation. But we've got to always start with God first. Can you see where Christianity could be just a little bit disruptive? We have to start. We don't start where we are and then work our way to God. We start where God is and, wake, and, and let him work his way to us. We don't agree with a political party over God and his word. And I know that this is red meat to a lot of our base that is here this morning. And I know that for some of you that disagree with me, and you disagree with me passionately, I want you to know that above everything else, I love you and I will never shame you for the vote that you cast. Because we've all, we're all growing, amen? We're all coming closer and closer to know Jesus. We're coming closer and closer to all of those things. And so free speech has to be protected. Whether you agree with the speech or not, it must be protected. I would like to be on the fact-checking team. <laughs> I, I know that there's a whole lot of people that were friends of mine or are friends of mine from high school. I was like, no way, absolutely not, man. You're too religious. So, Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 8 says, Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Use your voice. To speak for those who can't speak for themselves. There have been those and are those that have been marginalized by this life. Use your voice to not just prove your point, but to make a difference. Let me say that again. Use your voice to not just prove your point. Do you realize that for much of the world that you encounter every single day, if you go to them and say, the Bible says, you know what they're going to say? So what? What? What makes that any better than any other religious book? You have to figure out a way to present the gospel of Christ to people who do not believe the Bible. If you go to them and say, well, Jesus said, well, who cares what Jesus said? Now, I'm not saying, <laughs> I love what Jesus said, and I'm, I, I, I don't get this perfect, and I know none of us do, but I'm trying to submit my life to the sayings of Jesus because that's the the solid rock and the firm foundation. So use your voice. And, 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 and the writer here goes on, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Speak up for the rights of all those specifically who are poor, the marginalized, the outcast, the people who don't measure up, who aren't good enough. You and I have to use our voice. And what are we to say? We are to say that that is a person, a man, a woman, a boy or a girl that Jesus died for. That is a person who has value. That is a person that has, that has worth. And I don't care what their past has been. I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care what kind of junk they've had happen in their life because I'm a sinner one time who was saved by grace and had it not been for the grace of God, then I would not have known. And had there not been a person who was willing to listen to me and to hear who I was and to understand what I went through, I would not know this precious, loving Savior. We need to lend our voice and give our voice to those that have no other voice. So, apparently I got to be done. And I'm not. So, 
me ask you a quick question. I got a few of them left. Jesus, help me. Half of this country thinks that if Trump, if, if President Trump is reelected, that it's the end of this nation. It's going to go to hell in a handbasket. The other half believe that if Joe Biden is elected, it's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Both people are here. Let me ask you a different question, a better question. What if it doesn't matter? What if it doesn't matter which one of the two are elected? What if the nation, what if the wheels fall off of this nation? Nations come and nations go. History has shown us that nations that, that were at one time the most powerful and the most mighty and the most financial secu financially secure have been left in the waste bin of history. So what if, now I'm not saying that prayer doesn't matter. I'm not saying that your vote doesn't matter. I'm not saying that these things don't matter. I want you and I to think about this a little bit differently because no matter who wins on Tuesday, no matter which party is in power, no matter which way that current is, our job doesn't change. I really thought you'd be more excited about that. Now, in my opinion, your job will get a lot more difficult but it doesn't change because we're still supposed to be that transformational people on this earth who are praying, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's our job. It's our job. It's your job. I, 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 wanna, I hope you understand the passion I have for you is for you because I love you. And I know that we're divided, I know, but we cannot divide over these things. Political parties and politicians, they come and they go, but the kingdom of God is eternal, and that is where our allegiance is, first of all. You have this weird thing called dual citizenship. It's a cool thing, it's a wonderful thing. Let me explain it to you like this, or, or maybe use this as an illustration, and some of you are going to get really mad at me, but that's okay, please know I love you. If a person who is not from the United States of America... A person that is not from a citizen of the United States of America has no right to the benefits that are afforded to them in the Constitution, correct? Because they're not a citizen. Does that make sense? We all agree with that. And likewise, a person who's not a citizen of this nation, we don't realize this, we maybe don't understand this, but along with every freedom and along with every right, there are responsibilities as well. Amen? It's kind of our problem is that we all, we want, we're, we are like a, a, a teenager, when I was a kid, and I, I was just talking to, I didn't, what was your first name? I, she's 15, got her permit, and got all excited about, you know, she's going to get to drive and all those things. I started thinking back to when I was a kid, and, and I got a license. I could not understand, first of all, why my, I didn't grow up in the day where you got your license and a car kind of on the same day. I didn't grow up in that day. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Man, I wish I did. But anyway, my kids got better cars than I got. Anyway, all right, Sorry. Focus, Pastor Brian. So when, when, when I got my license, I went home and I was like, I passed my test. I get to drive the car. My mom was like, no, you don't. I'm like, what? I have a license. It, it, it's, I can, no, you, you're not. My, my mom understood something. She understood that I, while I had the right and I had the freedom, I had the privilege, I didn't, I didn't understand the responsibility that went along with it. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to carefully back, in fact, I did, carefully back out the driveway, pull away where she doesn't see me anymore, just... I tried it, man. Get in that sand and just turn the wheels on that big old boat Dodge Polara four door. Man, you're just going to. I did not. I did not have the emotional maturity to be able to handle the responsibility. I didn't want to. I didn't want to pay for the gas and I didn't want to pay for the insurance. I just wanted to look cool. I wanted to turn that AM radio up as loud as it would go and drive around with the window open and just be cool. The U.S. Constitution affords us rights as well as responsibilities, but a person who isn't a part of our nation has no right to the benefits that are there and, and no obligation to the responsibilities that are there because they're not a citizen. Are you tracking with me? Do you understand that? It's the same thing in the body of Christ. It's the same thing in the kingdom of God. A person that, that is not a citizen of the kingdom of heaven has no, should have no expectation to the benefits that are a part of that kingdom. They don't, they, they don't have any right to claim, in a sense, God's love or forgiveness because they're not a part of the kingdom. 
They don't have any right to the peace of God. They don't have any right to the joy of the Lord that is their strength because those are benefits of the kingdom of heaven. And likewise, stay with me, likewise, they do not have any of the burden of the obligation of what it means to be a follower of Christ either. And, and what has always, 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 I'm not gonna, what has always bothered me is when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ gets mad at sinners for acting like sinners. That we build up walls and we build up barriers. We build up these differences because they're not like us. And we expect them to, and, and we hold them to a standard that is different. I, you and I, we cannot stop anybody from in a sense, thumbing their nose at God and saying, God, I'm not going your way. In fact, many of those people don't even know what God's way is. And yet we want to, we want to judge them. We want to look at them and, and even immature believers. I hope that you are all growing in Christ. Do not stagnate, but have mercy and have grace. I was sitting in my office last week, and, and I've labored hard on this because I know it's contentious. And I know there's things that need to be said, and part of me feels like everybody knows it, and I feel like it's Christmas because I have to preach a message about Jesus coming to the earth, and everybody already thinks they know about it. I'm trying to help us this morning. I was sitting in my office, and I was thinking through these things and, and, and thinking about some of those things, and, and, and man, I, I, I got... Pastor Steph last week talked about how the Holy Spirit will just so lovingly remind you and tell you. And I was like, man, the Holy Spirit, I, I just only caught a part of what you said about Michelle, but it, it was kind of that same thing. It was like the Holy Spirit, it was not gentle. It was not kind. It was kind of rude, to be totally honest with you. Because he was challenging something that I thought in my own heart at times. And... <laughs> You and I, as followers of Jesus, are called to live differently than the rest of the world is. We can lament, and we should. And we should work hard. We should work hard when it comes to, to, to abortion. It is sad to me, roughly 80, well, roughly about 10,000 a year here in the state of Minnesota, that babies that are aborted. I know this is contentious. I know that this is, this is hard for people. That's a lot. But when we are using our voice to only prove a point, if there's 80,000 over the last 8 to 10 years, and, you know, again, experts agree, so I'll just pull a number out of the air to a certain extent, 80 to 100,000 abortions that have happened in the state of Minnesota, you know what that says? First of all, those babies are in heaven. I'm not saying that's awesome because they had a... They had a plan and a purpose. God had a plan and purpose for their life. God, God had designed for them before the foundations of the world. It is that knowledge that, do you, oh, here we go. Let me finish the Constitution part of it first. Then I, I got to be done. So, there's 80,000 women that have had abortions. And no doubt there are some who have been able to emotionally uh, or, or just, you know, have the capacity to say, you know what, it was just a bunch of cells and it was okay and it was justified. But I think there's a lot of women that are out there today that are carrying a burden. They're carrying a burden that's heavy. There's wondering and there's pain. And there might be regret and there might be all of those other things. And, and, and when we come across as holier than thou, when we come across as we're better than, what we are doing in essence often is we are shutting the door of, of ministry. I've said this the last couple of months and it's where we're headed as a church, but the ministry is in, a, in the mess. That's where the ministry is, it's in the mess. Listen to what this, I believe this dynamic changed the world. Go to the next one. It's over in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter six and verse two. Carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We have to, when we carry the burden of a person who is 
less fortunate than we are, when we carry the burden of a person who maybe has been marginalized by society, when we carry the burden of a person who has been repeatedly sold into, uh, you know, sex slavery and all the other things that go on, we're a hotbed right here in central Minnesota. Those things are happening right here in our back door. Much of the corruption and the junk and the garbage and the hate that we lament and, and point our finger at has happened on our watch, church. What's wrong? carry each other's burdens. When I spend enough time with you to know the weight that you're carrying, it changes me. And every time I do that, I'm fulfilling the law of Christ. And so it really kind of bothers me, trying to get done, when the church, and this is what happened, the the Holy Spirit just, man, just poked me. Because I kind of had this attitude once in a while, I do not like ingratitude I don't know if anybody else is like that. I just don't like it. And sometimes it's the sentiment of, of, you know, if they don't like it here, speaking of immigrants, speaking of people who have been brought here, however they've gotten here, if they don't like it, they can just leave. Love it or leave it. Now, I I agree with that. I I do not like ingratitude. That is a sign of the time, that people will be ungrateful. It's just a sign of the time. And I was just thinking through some things in my my just thought, and and suddenly on the inside of the Holy Spirit, it was like... have you ever considered, <laughs> you know, when, when, when it starts like that, it's generally not going in a great direction for Pastor Brian. <laughs> Have you ever considered that perhaps those people are right here in your backyard because my church wouldn't go to them? Have you ever considered that maybe I, I've done a miracle so that they can get to the only place in this world that they will experience this never-ending overwhelming, reckless love of God that you get to partake of every single day. And man, I repented. I was like, God, I am so sorry. Now, I have my personal opinions, and I have the way things ought to be done, like you do. But man, I appreciate Jim Schiffler. He's over here, and he several years ago did a thing with brought community leaders together in a lot of different ways, and He basically was talking, and he just said, you know what? All of these people are here, and they're not going anywhere. We got to figure this out. And church, can I tell you, we got to figure this out. Because there's a whole population of people that are right around you and me every day. And, and, And again, it really bothers me when we get mad at sinners for acting like sinners, but we don't ever question what we do. We get mad at the people who are on the corner. We get mad at people who are abusing governmental systems and they're taking money and they're doing all these other things. Well, just go get a job. But we don't think twice about walking into the doors of this church or any other church, assuming we got up on time, assuming we didn't have anything else going on that was more important. And we walk into the doors of this church and get mad if somebody asks us to contribute financially. We get mad if somebody asks us to serve and use the gift that is in proportion to the job that God asks you to do. And yet we'll walk out the door of this church and we'll say, well, they should just get a job. They're sucking off the government. Still want me to keep preaching? (laughs) Because if that's your attitude, you're wrong. If you're holding the world to a standard that you yourself are not willing to carry, if you're holding immature young believers to a standard that you are not living to, then you're in the wrong. And so am I. And we have a tendency to look down our puritanical noses at people as though because we know a few so in conclusion it was the message of Christianity it was the message of Christianity not politicians and not political parties that changed the world and if you're looking to a political party to change the world you're looking in the wrong place and you will be disappointed now I Vote. By all means, vote. By all means, get involved. Some of you need to run for office. Some of you need to do those things. But can I remind you that you are a child of God who is a part of an unshakable kingdom. And even though things around you will shake, man, you are a partaker of the divine nature. You're a partaker of God himself. And so let me just, I think, have I said to you that I'm going to finish? But why? Yeah, preach on. You know what all the children's workers are saying? Shut up. Will you just shut up? (laughs) The best social justice prison reform 
thing that ever happened in central Minnesota sitting right over there called Roy and Caroline. Amen. They chose to bear another's burdens. Pete and Karen Evans over here, you raised 43 babies, took them into your home, and you loved them, and you cared for them. You bore one another's burdens. Others in this church that have done remarkable things. That's what changed the world. It was the body of Christ that began to recognize the value and the worth and the love that God had on the individual. It was the body of Christ that changed infanticide. It was a common practice. It was just self-evident. You let babies die if you didn't want them. Christians came along and picked them up and brought them into their own homes. That's making a difference. And so do we want to make a difference or prove points? Pastor Brian, pray. Let me just read this. <laughs> so let's do what the early church did. Let's carry each other's burdens. When you help me carry my burden, you gain an understanding about who I am. And when you help me carry my burden, I get a better understanding of who you are. And when we carry each other's burdens, there's something that happens that cannot happen any other way. We may never agree politically, but we can love unconditionally. You don't have to understand me. You don't have to agree with me to love me. And I don't have to understand you. I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to know why you view things the way that you do to love you unconditionally. And it might seem small. It might seem like a seed. It might seem insignificant. But we can make this church and we can make our community and we can make our state and we can make our world better. Because after all, is that not what happened with a small group of believers in the upper room in Jerusalem who surrendered their identity? They surrendered their cultural ideas. They surrendered their gender differences, their racial differences their economic differences. They surrendered all of that to carry the culture of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and it turned the world upside down. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I know that I went way long. Church, I'm not even going to preach next week because I had preached twice. No, I am going to preach next week. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Please, uh, before I pray, please get out of this room right away and go get your kids and Give them a tip maybe for, for watching your kids extra long. Or maybe, I guess, maybe that's probably my responsibility, isn't it? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for these men and women. Thank you for this great nation that we get to be a part of, that we get to choose the direction. And so, Father, regardless, though, of which way this election goes, I know that I, I, there's a way I want, just like all of us want it to go, and, and yet those could be different. But, Father, help us to embrace and to engage the commission that you've given to us, your church, to always be mindful of our our example and our testimony that we are willing to step out and to step in and make a difference in people's lives. And Father, I thank you for this great church. And Lord, if there are those that misunderstand the passion, I ask that you help them to understand that. Father, we love you. And we want your will to be done on earth just like it is in heaven. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. God bless you, Joy Christian Center. We'll be here next week. We hope you will too. God bless you.